This is the JP News, now in HD. Tonight's features, Biker Night at Rookies, A Turtle on Girling Street, Ferguson meets House of Cards, and SWAT Team at Yates Village. <laughs> Take a picture. <laughs> Tommy, wa Tommy wants a picture of you in here. I want a picture of me, please. There's one. There's two. Maybe just one more. There we go. Okay, here we are at Union Street and not Terrace. And there appears to be a broken water main. Water is gushing down the hill. There's a barricade here. And uh, some workmen are over here. This is located right over by Union College. Hey, don't steal that bike now. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you're going too fast! <laughs> oh, wow. I mean... Are you all lined up again? This is the Jess Petchwin Cam Corner News, and we are here at Vale Park. And I've just been informed that all these blue wrappers are. Here, you got, uh, these are heroin bags. Yeah, you got different kinds. Um, you got the blue ones are certain, they usually mm -hmm. use a brand name. Yeah. It's hard to tell because they got washed out. Does the heroin come in different flavors? No. Oh. It comes different, different um, suppliers. And so this is an so indicator. Normally yeah. in New York City, they'll have yeah. different heroin dealers will be dealing for different people, mm -hmm. and they want to keep their own product separate because yeah. that way they have like a certain pride. But um, in, these, in these, you can't see the stamp. Yeah. They don't always have a stamp, but normally they would have a stamp for like a name like Poison or... You know, they could be anything. Exterminator. So this is an indication that um, groups of heroin addicts meet here and uh, 
and fry one up. Well, I don't know how else they got here. Okay. I didn't put them there, did you? No, I didn't know. No. I don't do that stuff. Uh, does the what 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 does what does heroin actually do for someone? What kind of a high does it give them? It makes them sedated. Oh. And it makes you think like everything is fine, even though it's really not. And then before you know it, they're hooked. Oh, okay. They got to spend every last penny they got on it. Okay. And they start doing crime. Oh. This thing's huge. I haven't seen a turtle this big. Oh my god. This thing's big. Holy smokes. This is one big ass turtle. It is the size of a turkey platter full of meat. Oh my god, it's it's quivering up here. Come on, walk some more, buddy. That is one big, huge damn turtle. I can't believe it. Just to give an idea how big this turtle is, here's my foot. It is, it is at least the length of my foot even more, probably the length of two of my feet, if you were to count its long pointed tail. Yeah. That's a good size one. Come on, I'm gonna look at that How's it going, buddy? Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> hey, where you gonna hit him, Gino? <laughs> hit him walk. Hey, he's making him walk at least. Now he's doing something for my camera at least. <laughs> I think that's a snapper. I don't. I, by the shape of his head. Well, yeah, they don't. They don't normally get that big unless they're a snapper, right? Yeah. You're not gonna make it through there, buddy. <laughs> Poor thing. You might not like him, but you, you should respect him because he is very, you have to respect his oh, intelligence. Respect <laughs> okay, this is William Aiken's new book that is now, uh, what, completed? Mm hmm Okay. And in print. And in print. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight on this, the launch of my second novel. Um, if you go on to read the book, there, that's you... Better may be surprised to know that the genesis of this book was based on uh, sort of a George Costanza type character who was a prosecutor and I just had these visions of him testifying before Congress trying to spin data that didn't look well on him. Like he might say something like, to suggest that there is a racial disparity in our law enforcement is a slight, well this kind of Costanza to suggest and it kind of, he has kind of a very uh, pious, arrogant way in arguing his position that kind of appealed to me. And then there was a case, I believe, in 2009 of a woman who was holding her baby during a drug raid and the people, the, the agents came in the door and they came in from two different parts of the house and the other agents were shooting at the the pit bulls that were there, and the agent heard this, and so he shot instinctively and killed the woman and shot her one-year-old baby. Okay. So that had gave me a lot of material to go through. I had the whole trial to see how it was handled, to see how it was covered. And um, then we have the, the title character, which is the chosen one, who is probably not the most material devoted to him in the book. But it centers around the premise of these situations of drug rates seem to always happen to people of less means, who can't fight the system, who can't hire a, a Ethne Bailey to go after them, to defend them. But what if it happened to someone who was of means and who did have a big spotlight on them 
And what if that person became the most vocal critic of the drug war? I thought of that those three elements intrigued me, and the um, the character of the drug czar evolved from being a, an ambitious prosecutor to getting appointed to the um, uh, overseeing what what in the book is referred to as odd operation door to door, where they do these militant type of drug raids in multiple cities. And then I thought, well, don't get too caught up in the backstory. I just put him right there where he's a deputy and he takes over someone who's not as zealous, is not such a zealot in prosecuting the drug war. It kind of um, ins inspired me to see how when we have one type of president that the next cycle of elections elects a very different type of president. You look back and say how we had Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, mm -hmm. and the backdrop of this story is that we had a liberal president who didn't, who the candidate was able to exploit as being weak on these issues, and he uses the drug war as a catalyst to say, well, we're really going to get tough. We're really going to win this, you know, once and for all. And has even in the president's name, President Hafler, kind of suggests that he's can be easily led to uh, to these kind of uh, misguided decisions. So um, it came together relatively quickly. It took me two years to write. Um, my first one gathered dust for many years. It took me 22 years from the time when I started writing it to the time it was published. So I'm very <coughs> pleased with the, um, the, that I was able to do it so quickly and it was a great environment working here because I could get feedback from my family members. They could read a chapter then I could process and, you know, go forward from there. Um, I think that what's happening in Ferguson was obviously something I didn't plan, but my friend who's reading the book now was struck by how many similar parallels there were. And what's very exciting for me is that I have the story of the case being prosecuted, and then you wonder, well, how does that compare with the story in Ferguson? Is it going to be prosecuted? Will the grand jury come back? And I would, uh, Jane asked me how to describe the book. I said it was a political courtroom drama. But I also think it paints, large, asks larger questions about, you know, the whole societal role of what government should be and how to address these inequities that have been so fired up with, with Ferguson. So, um... I guess no one's read the book as of yet, so if there's any questions I can answer, I'll be glad to do that now. I read your book, <laughs> and I read it um, in a hurry, uh, because I didn't know any characters personally that were in the book. But when I got to the middle of the book, I knew them all too well, and um, I finished the book uh, at a higher rate of speed and believed that um, your idea that the public is more afraid of uh, bad drugs and does not include alcohol as one of them. Oh, please, you're going to turn this into an alcohol. <laughs> uh, but it just showed me how I, I, I purposely it. left alcohol out of this <laughs> as best I could, but I, I, you'll find a way, I guess, to, to bring that but in. That's what a free society offers. A different society. But, but how, could, how could you come to that conclusion when I never mentioned alcohol? At all. That's right. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe they, maybe, maybe, they, maybe someone had a beer at a, during a meeting or something, but. Yeah, what's the beer? <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> Maybe the book goes better happen. with alcohol. It can't happen. It is a realistic fiction. <laughs> no, that's true. My mom read it, though. No, I haven't yet. Oh, I just looked at the cover. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I didn't know. <laughs> go, go ahead, so Lily. What in your own experience caused you to be that this motivated about writing this book? My own experience? Um, I guess that goes back to when I first started getting interested in drug policy issues and I saw that there was these huge disparities but no one seemed to care or everyone seemed to say, oh, well, that's because you know, blacks commit more crimes, right, right. and I and it, it, that kind of whole seed was planted in me when I saw these figures. I went out and did a documentary about it that I thought was very fascinating because everyone had an opinion about it, and sometimes, regardless, when you showed them the evidence, even the district attorney of Albany, when I showed him the evidence. He said, well, why that is, implying that the, the racial disparity, I, the, the answer to that question is, I don't know. I mean, the, the data shows, yes, that, that they, they use less drugs and they are arrest, or they, whatever the disparity was. And so I thought it was a very befuddling thing for people to have to try to answer, but they were always willing to answer that. So that was, was kind of what got me in the realm of it. But then also, when I heard that LeBron James was deemed the chosen one, and he actually has a tattoo on his leg identifying him as the chosen one, I thought that was pretty, pretty um, self-congratulatory for someone who puts a ball in a basket. And he, he didn't come up with the that term, but to, some sports writer for Sports Illustrated did a thing when he was in high school and they had a, the cover the chosen one with him dunking a basketball so I thought why don't I take my skepticism about that title and trans channel it through the, the character of his stepsister who questions him about that and then his stepsister goes on to get killed and that leaves a heavy um, he leaves him with a heavy heart to try to advocate for her. I'm trying to, to capitalize on this events, myself promoting this. If my efforts fall short within the next month, I might um, take an uh, offer to have the book reviewed by a national re critic who would have the publication in many media outlets. So that would... You have an offer? It's a paid, I, you pay for it, it's a oh, service you oh, pay okay. for. Oh, so I'm, I'm trying to see how I handle it on my own, and I think that I'll be uh, wiser in a couple months to see how to play it, how to, to how approach. About, any chance of the open door? The, I have, they have a copy, yeah. They have, they have a copy? Mm hmm That's well, you know, my I sister's could actually picture. ask at the library and ask them to get a copy. But if you request the library, they will, they will get a copy. Oh yeah, they'll take them. I'll try. Well, why don't you just buy one right here? I'm not no, talking no, for myself. I'm saying oh. to get a copy in the circulation. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be great. Um, also, in in each copy of the book, I put a uh, promotional card where you can get an ebook um, download to, as well that comes with the book. Oh. And then in the tart, the hard, the hard cut, cut, yeah, that. The chosen one. So I th also think it's a good crossover of politics and sports media, combining the two to uh, to yeah. work with that. So, any other comments or questions about the... Uh, do the bookmarks, um, do people buy them with the books? Uh, I provide them when I sell them, yeah. Oh. They came okay. to me. 
But if you buy them from me, then I, I provide you with a bookmark and a download for the uh, ebook version. Oh. Just use a hundred dollar bill for the bookmark. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hello, fellas. Water. Good evening. This is uh, Jeff Petroquin Camcorder News, and there appears to be a situation here over at Yates Village, uh, which is located in the northern side of Schenectady. It is the housing development and um, it's gathering a little bit of attention as we pan right. Um, some of the town folks are down here watching things unfold. Another cruiser has arrived and we will now see what may happen. It is another half hour later and still nothing really has happened. There's a police officer over here. Uh, there is a group of plain closed officers in the background there on that porch. Uh, and there is four squad cars here. Uh, there's probably four more. And we still have some people standing around watching the action. I believe that this apartment here is the one they're, they're uh, checking out for a uh, culprit of some sort. Still, still absolutely nothing happening here. It's a SWAT team. We believe that this is the Special Forces Unit. Uh, maybe they're going to make an approach. Uh, men with uh, face shields and vest are assembling uh, against this one building. And over here, this building here, I think, is the building that they have their eye on, but is not, not known yet. And they're moving toward the house. Guns drawn. <laughs> and, uh, and they're going behind the building. Doing that. And there's, there's nobody in, even in C1. Gina. She Gina. lives in C1, guys. No, they're bringing somebody out the back oh, door. Cool. All right, all right. There's nobody in C1? No, that's my house. Well, they're bringing somebody out your back door. Or unless they're in C3, they're bringing somebody out the back door. Of my house? There's two chairs? Well, they actually, did, yeah, and I think this is considered SWAT team. They have the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is considered SWAT I think I have the Costco. This is who lives in C1. The Costco. Just don't destroy my stuff, that's all. No, they can't. They can't even go in there. I don't There's think they... There's nobody, I know. There's nobody in there. They can't go in her house. Well, they can't go in the house. Because I could use some new furniture, some new TVs. C3, I think? Look, 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 look. He stays and watches their back, and then they go, and now they're watching his back. <laughs> it's not funny, but seriously, they do they, they a serious situation. It's a girl and her baby that lives in C3. But there's nobody there. And so why don't they knock on the door? She's there. The same reason why there's they called Gerard to shut her up. They're, They're taking the lady out of the house, the girl. 
they go in our house yet. Hey, we haven't talked to that dirty ass lady, what they? Why are they going in her house? Like, what they think, they in the next door? We haven't talked to that dirty oh, ass. Oh, maybe they think he's in here. They're moving again. And this is the second or third time they've gone behind this building. I got aliens living in my basement and every day I'm thinking about coast to coast. I got children. I didn't know they were hybrids. <laughs> aliens came and that's the way it is. Every night I'm coast to coast. <laughs>